Peter is up here also, so questions can be directed at the at any of the speakers. I had a question regarding the, the modernity versus traditional model. Um, my understanding is, for example, in Latin America, that um, prior to the European arrival in, in, in the Americas, that the crops that were basically grown were food crops. And then after that, um, they brought uh, crops that originated in Africa, for example, sugarcane, coffee, and so forth. Um, in the case of India and so forth, did this, was there a change there? Or, or indeed, in the traditional model, did they grow foodstuffs and then later grow more cash crops? I guess that's my. Of course, people have always grown foodstuffs, right? Or they wouldn't, you know, be able to eat. But, and reconstructing the history of what people do with crops is always a little difficult, of course. But it's, it's very clear in the South Asian context that commercial production, that is production for markets, for the supplying of cities and so on, was very well established in, or even by the first couple of centuries AD. So commercial is, production for exchange was not an invention of the colonial period by any means. And I'll let, I mean, I'll let Alan actually, if he wants, weigh in on the Latin American side since you know, Alan's other identity as a specialist in, in Andean uh, anthropology and archeology span is not you know, maybe evident to this group, but you know, my, my you know, sense of the, the New World situation is that you know, in, in context where there were large urban societies, there was production of food for exchange as well, right? And that there are many kinds of crops that, you know, the crop that you call food, I mean, what, what constitutes food is an interesting question, right? Because I mean, sugar, like sugar cane, which is which grown in, in, in both Southeast and South Asia for a very long time. I mean, you know, it is it's, it's food, but it's also grown on a commercial scale, right? Um, you know, you could think maybe cacao and other kinds of New World crops, which you can argue less they have political consequences, but are they food? I mean, we really start to get into sort of definitional problems. But I guess the the basic point I would make is that commercialization and production for exchange is in no way in South Asia or really at any other part of the world, I think, an invention of colonialism. It's something that comes about when we get large aggregated um, settlements and groups of people who are dependent on you know, other food producers who are specialists. I, I want to thank everybody for these presentations. At, at, at certain moments, of course, uh, I think it's impossible not to develop a sense that uh, we're surrounded by crocodiles. And uh, <laughs> our best hope is to make friends with them or make them our relatives. Then, and then uh, and, until we have the means to actually exterminate them, uh, we'll just, that's our safest bet. But, and I know that's not what you're saying. Uh, uh, because uh, I, I take the argument that uh, the, the fantastical memories and often westernized memories of, of traditional pasts uh, uh, are, are not a way to, to deal with the problems that are being faced uh, now. But I, I guess my question is, this wonderful research that shows uh, how environmental situations have been formed over centuries and in fact we've dealt with or people have dealt with uh, environmental catastrophe in the past. Uh, uh, I, I'm wondering how, and, and, and this argument that, that, that there's a need to push beyond the rhetoric of, of traditionalism versus modernity. I'm wondering how, it sounds to me as though you're also all, all arguing that, that uh, people in these localities, the elites within these the localities where, where these challenges are being faced, need themselves to build beyond the rhetoric of modernity versus traditionalism. And I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm curious how you think this kind of research can feed into the discourses within uh, Iraq and within uh, South Asia uh, so that from this, this kind of uh, scholarship, there can be a new political solution on the ground uh, that, that is outside of a, a kind of Western imposition or, or uh, uh, first world imposition. 
guess I get painted into answering that one because he's at a rock. So. <coughs> uh, how can this uh, research inform sort of solutions and improving things on the ground? Is that ultimately what the question is? I mean, hey, my solution was easy. Buy electricity and you, and you get some water. But I think ultimately, if we look beyond sort of the, the immediate to this longer term history, we, we tend to find at least a more ultimate cause of the problem. If, if you start at the immediate, you get cosmetic solutions. It's cosmetic to, you know, close one sluice gate, flood a little bit of the marsh, make some people go live in it, and bring in some tourists, which is what's kind of being proposed in Iraq, right? That doesn't actually restore marshes. It doesn't restore anybody's way of life. Um, it's hard to get another nation to release more water. I mean, that, that's an ultimate solution. It's, it's an ultimate t solution to you know, radically change your forestry practices. It's an ultimate. But until you get to the real cause of it, you're not going to get a real solution. I think that's, I mean, this is my you know, happy, optimistic, naive, quintessentially American view. But uh, that's, that's what it is. So. <laughs> That's the point. Let me just try a little bit on that one too, um, because you know Josh. Josh's background is in uh, you know Middle East studies and public policy. So I mean, he's you know in a sense charged with dealing with pol these kind of policy problems and finding solutions, right? I mean, I myself am an archaeologist. So I mean, I, I have as a discipline, we're not generally trained or expected to make any kind of contribution to the world at all, let's face it, <laughs> other than to satisfy our own curiosity. But you can wag your finger. Train right? our students, yeah, but we can <laughs> wag our fingers. But I think that this is, you know, far too easy a, a position. And, you know, my colleague, Alan Collada, who is also an archaeologist, you may not, uh, again, even be able to tell, has done, <laughs> from his presentation, you know what I mean, um, has done a lot of work in the Andes on you know, it, taking the kind of the lesson, historical lessons of, agri of a, uh, older agricultural production and applying them to you know, changing contemporary strategies. So I think that you know, the first step is talking to each other, that people who are historians and paleoecologists and archaeologists need to be part of the discussion and be willing to engage with development, public policy, and you know, the, the contemporary world, not be afraid to do it and to offer our perspective, so that's part of the dialogue. And, and also, of course, you know, again, I'm a professor, so I mean, I think education is also an important part of, um, of this. And that this is, these are not issues that we're gonna solve, you know, one, one man does and one man undoes, right? These are all, clearly, I think we would all agree, problems that we're gonna have to work on together. And there are politicians and policy peoples and historians and agronomists and, you know, all of these kinds of people um, who are, who's, uh, data and perspectives are going to need to be taken into account. So the first step, I think, is just begin talking to each other and to integrate and trying to integrate this information into the um, kinds of political decision making and the models that are used in the development world. Ellen, did you want to talk a bit about your, I mean, those relationships in your project? Um, I will, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I would just, just well, just adding to that, I think, um, one thing is clear, talking to each other is important, but after a decade of talking to an economist and a set of ecologists, uh, it's difficult. Uh, <laughs> in my own department of anthropology, it is quite frankly has been for years apostasy for an anthropologist to actually work and talk to an economist. Now, I don't feel that way about the economists I work with. We actually talk about similar problems and issues, but it really does come down to the fact that an economist has a way of modeling the world that's very different from the way an anthropologist uh, models the world and the way an ecologist models the world and even our sense of what a model is is com entirely different. Now this has been 10 years of trying to figure out what we're all talking about and I really cannot say honestly that we still really truly perceive uh, what the other's issues are, the methods, and of course this is that classic problem that NSF now is trying to pour money into uh, trying to get qualitative and quantitative work uh, together to address certain problems, and it's very difficult. So uh, I think we have to keep talking to each other, uh, but it's got to be a lot more intense, and one dimension of that with respect to the academy, I think, is that we have a real problem of interdisciplinarity, in my view, and that is fundamentally that only people who essentially are lucky to get to senior positions and can essentially abandon their discipline, if you will, 
uh, essentially move away from their discipline, they don't have to be resolutely disciplined at some stage in their career, are the ones doing the conversation. Whereas the younger faculty are inhibited. They all have to do their uh, discipline. They really have to do that to be able to get the positions, to be able to get the kind of <coughs> promotions and salaries and research funds and grant access. Uh, there are very few, in my view, very few, very uh, effective interdisciplinary degrees where one can get something that is called an interdisciplinary degree. If you're not an economist or an anthropologist and, and, uh, or an ecologist and you know those disciplines like the back of your hand, you're in real trouble. And this is a real problem and I don't know how to get around it. It has to do something with governance, with the systems that our universities are engaged in, the move, the sense of tenuring and all of those issues to a situation in which we can really have young people, young faculty in there driving some of this interdisciplinary. Otherwise, it's just going to be people like me and others in privileged positions where I can just ignore the fact that one day I'm an archaeologist and pretend I'm an economist over here or talk to an ecologist. I mean, this is something that only a very few people can do, and that's not enough. We need critical mass of people, and I don't think we have that yet. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a question for Kathleen Morrison. Really enjoyed your talk. and. Uh, can definitely see how I'll use that in my world history class. Uh, but my question for you, uh, I really enjoyed your historical analysis and learned a lot. Um, my question is, what do we know about resettlement in traditional times? Uh, did kings or local rulers do it? Uh, or did local rulers maybe care less about local peoples and how they dealt with rising waters? Or maybe, uh, I was also thinking there were simply fewer people to be moved. Um, I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about resettlement in traditional times, if there's anything on that. Uh, and then just also if you could talk a little bit about the historical analysis for uh, resettlement today. I'm thinking about the uh, World Bank report in the late 1990s or early 2000s in, in which they, they commended China, for example, the country that I study most deeply for its resettlement work. So I'd be interested to hear about that, your historical perspective on that in South Asia. Thanks. That's a really tough question because from the, for the older periods, just thinking about it, I think that there really is no historical documentation of any kind of resettlement scheme. The, the kinds of evidence that we see for inundation of you know, villages, agricultural land, is entirely archaeological, that is. Um, so there, which is interesting, actually, because it's the kind of, you know, it's a very specific kind of historical record that we're thinking about for this time period. And it's, you know, it's, it's highly stylized and it, it has its own peculiarities. And there's a lot of discussion about things like maintenance and repair of reservoirs, but really actually nothing about um, loss of access to lands uh, or even things like temples. And clearly there were temples that were, you know, covered over. As recently as the late 40s, early 50s, there again is really minimal documentation on resettlement and inundation. Because in the area where I've been doing the archeological work with the older reservoirs, there's also the last, actually the modern dam I showed in my very last slide, the Tungabhadra Dam, which was started under the British and completed um, in 1954 after independence. That dam has lost three quarters of its capacity due to siltation. Um, and has a lot of the same kinds of problems. But there, again, we don't exactly know how many people were displaced because there really aren't good documents. Um, but we can look at old maps and, uh, to a certain extent, actually, the material record, too, because as the reservoir silts in and its capacity is decreased and there are droughts, then, you know, the villages and temples and things sometimes pop up again. Right? So, I mean, it's very clear that there, were a lot, there was a tremendous difficulty created, but um, what the record of that is, I don't know. The, the modern problem, of course, is, is again, uh, very different, where we have a lot of information, but quite conflicting information, because the government reports on resettlement settlement schemes are a lot more optimistic than the reports of NGOs. Um, and uh, where people even do have title to land, which is a lot of the big problem, right? Because people have to prove that they had title to lands that are being lost, right? Um, the places where dams are located and who gets displaced by rising floodwaters is again not a kind of, let us say, innocent question because it seems disproportionately concentrated on, on the so-called tribal peoples and lower caste and poor, people who don't have, as we like to say in Chicago, political clout, 
right? So to <laughs> exempt their, their lands from being uh, inundated. So these are the people who are already the poorest of the poor in any case, very often don't have title to lands, and the, some, some of the lands that are lost are common lands that no one has title to. And so people are doing grazing and firewood collecting and all the other kinds of things um, that they're cut off from. And so it's part of the, what happens is a large scale migration to cities. Um, so it's really intensifying rural to urban kinds of migra migration schemes. And also because, as I said, the kinds of agriculture, agricultural regimes that come in after the construction of many of these dams, not all, but many, are a focus on very high value, water intensive, commercial, wet crops. And that's the kind of thing that absorbs labor as in a kind of underclass way and very few privileged landowners, not the kind of thing that's like, you know, widespread employment. A lot of the rhetoric of construction of these schemes were so that, you know, all the farmers could have some water for their millets and sorghum and other kinds of dry crops. But instead, what you get is commercial production of rice and sugarcane and, and that kind of thing. I, the Chinese case may be quite different, and I'm not, you know, again, I'm not ne necessarily really a, a scholar of modern dams. So um, I, I'm sure then that the peculiarities of, of government and the kinds of problems of corruption and the nature of politics across different state boundaries in the case of India, because state governments are usually the ones uh, involved. Uh, ha has a lot to do with it. So it, it's a very interesting question. I can't really answer it. <laughs> I just uh, appreciate you debunking the past as if we could go back to the past, everything would be fine. And that they dealt with problems in not s always sustainable ways. But perhaps you could give us a few examples where traditional cultures did a good job of finding sustainable solutions. Were there any dams that were torn down or any kind of forest restorations that you look back pre-colonial times where they did solve some problems? Look, I, don't want to, I don't want to hog the mic. I'll just say, you know, in, in the case of the area where we study, actually a very interesting thing is the canal system. These canals are hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of canals that take off from the river. They were built, again, mostly from the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th century. And they required massive investments in labor on the part of this, then, you know, the central government. They were financed by kings, and they were pretty much you know, kind of central planning sort of thing. That's, I mean, that is a kind of, you know, if you have a kind of this new traditionalist perspective, you know, like, that's gonna be bad, right? When you have a kind of centrally planned government scheme cannot be good, right? On the other hand, what we see is that the canal system, the, the middle, the pre-colonial canal system is still in use, actually, and works extremely well. I mean, it's, it's, it's managed by a farmer cooperative, interestingly enough, which emerged, I think, when central political uh, uh, control collapsed. Right? So these very, very old canals are working very well. There's no serious problems of salinization or waterlogging. They've been supporting you know, intensive production of wet crops for over 600 years um, without any apparent difficulty whatsoever. The reservoir system, on the other hand, is virtually all abandoned, um, and there were clearly various serious kinds of ecological consequences. Now, they're, they're both, they were both initially created um, through the activities of elites, you know, working, and some worked, and you know, some didn't. And part of the specifics, I think, in this case, has to do with the very peculiar kinds of topographic and environmental constraints of the different systems. So this you know, lesson, as it were, is not necessarily a lesson for the whole world. It's a lesson for locations with these kinds of soils and slopes and you know, that kind of thing. So yeah, I mean, there's, it's, there's good and bad. I uh, could I just yeah, briefly say one thing here? Actually, it's not, I do not disagree with my colleague Kathleen. I wouldn't dare to do that. Uh, she, she heads this operation. But actually, uh, what I would say is, I, and I agree absolutely with uh, what uh, her uh, analysis of the, this contrast between modernity and tradition, and that one has to be very careful the way, particularly environmentalist rhetoric, has taken up the traditional and the ancient systems as some sort of a panacea and a situation of, of course, the classic, the, the noble savage as. Uh, stewards of the environment and so forth. I also think, though, in my own perspective, that that counter rhetoric of we can't all be romantic up here has perhaps gone to rather, uh, ex ex to an extreme, to the extent that in fact there are indigenous systems that are rather sustainable at certain scales. There are people who actually have very different sense of value in the landscape. They think of value in different way. It isn't commodity driven necessarily. It's perhaps kind of pragmatic hybrid systems in which they're engaged in commercial production, but they also are engaged 
in agriculture as something that actually generates systems of value that are very different than what we think of in modernity. So those things should be thought of and not simply dismissed as sort of, a, well, romance of the past. And in fact, I'm passionate about this because there's an interesting book, uh, which is from a social anthropology student uh, who I invited into my research project in the Andes to actually analyze a project I was doing that Kathy alluded to on uh, agricultural systems. And the entire book uh, was essentially an attack on the project that I directed, which was fine, because this is what I invite my students to do all the time. That's what we do at Chicago. We're always arguing with each other. And that was fine. But it is, again, based on, I think, an extreme representation of this rhetoric of, well, it's all agrarian romanticism if you attempt to even think that there is a future for rural areas. Uh, and I think we have to be very careful, too, at the same time, to balance our sense of what is value, what are we talking about here, so that we don't uh, dismiss some of these non-Western traditional indigenous, which, again, are figured, as Kathy Bradley says, small scale when they're not, when you look at these reservoirs that that uh, Kathy works with, they're absolutely scalar if we're worried about scale and size and global solutions. Well, we can look there for some possible solutions as well. <laughs> Maybe yeah. one more question. Sure, a uh, few comments to Josh. Uh, the first one, uh, after 1950, uh, the dam built in the Eastern Turkey, Syria, and Iran, they uh, create a certain impact to the uh, marsh area. And uh, be because this area is the confluence of the Tigris and Euphrates. And actually, uh, uh, in 1993, Saddam Hussein, he implemented the engineering plan created in Britain during the colonial period to create those canal. And then uh, right now we know that the water resources are shared by Iran, Turkey, and Syria. So for the restoration, uh, I would say need to be carefully uh, deal with the international politics regarding the water resources uh, 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 sharing. Uh, second comment, uh, the local, yeah, after 1993, the water uh, through the canal uh, to create the agricultural irrigation. And after we restored the marshland, they, they definitely have an impact between the the current agricultural irrigation and the marsh area. Number three, <laughs> the, the application of the, the hydroelectric, uh, I consider is so significant at this moment, especially for those countries, Iraq, Iran, Syria, Turkey, to fulfill the greenhouse gases uh, there in the Kyoto Protocol. I believe those important factors need to be considered. And then number four, the oil factor. We know that Iraq is the, the second largest oil reserve country. The proven reserve is about 1,000 billion uh, a barrel. And then the, the reserve basically in the southern region of Iraq. And I believe this is the area. So oil factor is the, the one of the factors need to be dealt with in the political discussion. And then the last one. Uh, I saw your GIS map, and actually my suggestion is GIS, most of people use for mapping purpose. And I, ca I believe you can, along with the topography data, to carefully <laughs> calculate the water needed to restore it in the area. It's doable. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK. Um, I don't disagree with uh, a thing you said. Um, the, the, the problem with the marshes is that you're absolutely correct. The, there's a political reality that other countries are holding this water back and they're doing something good with the water. They're producing energy for their countries that otherwise would be produced in some other means. All true. The problem with the marshes ultimately I think is that many of the local people don't necessarily want marshes there and perhaps the ecological reality is that marshes would probably dry up and go away if somebody wasn't trying to keep them there. It's, it's very possible that uh, the, the local people would use what water is left for agriculture or they would dry it out for expansion of uh, oil production or something else. It may be that wetlands and marshes are a relic of the past. Wetlands dry up all the time for a variety of different reasons. Um, but somebody has decided that you need to keep some marshes there uh, in, in Iraq. And that's fine, right? But if that marsh becomes a museum, 
in which people have to live uh, because somebody has decided they have to live there, that's a problem. Uh, particularly if the way that they want to live doesn't sort of accord to what life in that marsh is like. Um, so it may be that these marshes just sort of need to be forgotten about, and that doesn't really settle or uh, it's not a good taste in a lot of people's mouths to, to admit that that might be uh, a bygone era. Um, you're absolutely correct. There's no real good solution, and I take all of your comments. Thank you. All right, with that, we'll uh, conclude this afternoon's program, and I want to thank all the panelists for participating and for the very interesting talk. <laughs>